Quite possibly, the first genuine electric motor in existence was the Faraday motor, and if you looked at it, well, there was a bit of wire in some mercury that spun around, and it was pants. If you thought that that was going to be any use, your immediate impression would be, nah, that's just a scientific curiosity. But of course, the electric motor is fundamental to our way of living. Of course, in the 1800s, this was an engine. It was massive, it was reliable, it was absolutely everywhere, and it basically moved up and down. So this walking beam engine, made by Ray Newman at the Whitstable Community Museum, will demonstrate what I mean. There we go, steadily thumping up and down. With such tried and true technology dominating the engineering of motors, is it any wonder that the first electric motors basically copied steam? They had an up and down reciprocating motion, and we now know that as the solenoid engine. The operation of a solenoid is based on the fact that when you put an electric current down a coil of wire, you create an electromagnet, and of course an electromagnet can do one of two things. It can either attract or repel another magnet, or it can attract a lump of iron into its center, because in the center, the energy state is the lowest. And this is the design principle for just about every modern solenoid. You turn on that power, you create an electromagnet, the bar is drawn into the solenoid, and hey presto, we have a working solenoid. Now, if you take that principle and that mechanical movement and attach it to a crank and flywheel, what you get is a very early solenoid motor. Now, a solenoid motor always has a switch. The motor is switched on, the bar is drawn into the electromagnet, and there's a linkage or a cam that switches the switch back off. And because the flywheel is now turning, it continues to turn, drawing the bar out and putting it back into its start position, and the cycle repeats. So there are a ton of videos showing you how to make solenoid motors and loads of 3D models to print off, including this one by Gemini Studios, where you can make solenoid motors until your heart's content. They're lovely things to make with only one problem. They're a little bit inefficient. Of course, there are lots of efforts to improve the engineering and efficiency, and perhaps the most famous, if you like, infamous, is Art Porter and the Gap Motor. I think the Gap Motor is rather clever. It is, in fact, a latching solenoid. It's a solenoid with a magnet on the end, and what that does is latches the solenoid bar in its fixed position. But Art uses a whole bunch of magnets on the reverse side of the coil. Then when he turns the current on, of course, what we get is flux switching. So when the current's off, then we get magnetic repulsion. When you turn the current on, the flux is pushed away and we get magnetic attraction. And this repeats until we get this cycling. Unfortunately, Art has claimed over unity, which has kind of thrown this idea into the bin to a degree with a lot of people, but it's certainly an interesting idea. Imagine when it comes to motors and generators, flux switching isn't something that immediately springs to mind. But in terms of generators, it's the power source on just about all the missiles that there are. And for radio, the Anderson generator produced huge amounts. For motors, it's what Dyson is using in his latest handheld. And the reason is they're incredibly simple to make, that they're mechanically very simple. They can turn at stupidly high speeds. We're talking about one uh, to 200,000 RPM. They can get connected directly to a turbine without any gearing and give huge output because of that relationship of speed. So there's an awful lot that can recommend flux switching when looking at generation that we just don't think about. Normally flux switching, well, we'll meet it every day when it's in things like guitar pickups. It's what Flynn was on about when he's looking at his fluxing uh, generator. And it's what you find in units that you can turn off and on. All of these use flux switching. So if I hold a couple of magnets up in the air and wave them out about, the magnetic field is going all over the place. It's following a path like that out in air, and it can have an effect on absolutely everything. If I take a couple of pieces of steel and pop them one on top of the other, these are called keepers now. That magnetic flux is contained within the steel because that's by preference where it wants to go. It always wants to follow the path of least resistance. And the least resistance, or if you like reluctance, is 
through that steel rather than through the air. So now all the magnetic flux is following the path of least reluctance and it's going through that steel. So we've created a flux path. We've done this before as well when we bent magnetic fields around. You can do that if you use a path of least reluctance for the flux to actually follow. It will want to follow the material where it has the least resistance or reluctance in magnetic terms to flow. Now by changing that path, by changing the arrangement of the metal and giving the magnetic flux a path that it more wants to go, I can direct that path to where I want it to be. And that's the principle that switching flux relies on. So all of that is very interesting. <laughs> but it's another way. I find all of that very interesting and I'm hoping you do too. But where does it actually lead us? Well, if you remember in video 2019, we made this, which is the in-engine drive mechanism because it's supposed to be more efficient. Now, it clearly is ideal for sticking some solenoids on here. And if we use flux switching solenoids, I'm hoping we'll be able to create an engine, a solenoid engine that is far more efficient than every other engine. Fingers crossed. So the next task is to create some solenoids on here and use those solenoids to drive the in engine. I hope you enjoyed the explanation video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe and look out for the completed engine.